George DiGiani, Train Station Fitness Show. It's 6.50 in the morning. Got a special show for you today because there's a special person uh, here, a friend of mine, Tracy Tim. Uh, and she and I became friends how long ago, what do you think? Oh, my gosh. Not even, what, two, three months ago? Two, three months ago. Yeah. And we hit it off because we have a similar focus, a similar goal in making a positive, profound difference in people's lives. And we'll talk more about that, what that is uh, on the show today. But uh, Tracy, uh, Tracy is a Yale graduate, so you have both a, a Yaley and a Havardian in the room. And we have a little bit of rivalry, rivalry that we're going to have to – we're going to have to keep our banter off air. <laughs> but what's really interesting about you, and a lot of people aren't aware of this, is uh, it, what this term is, that you, you are a human capital advisor and for, for many of the Dallas fastest-growing companies uh, for um, – executives and young professionals and you're coaching these people because you had a story that you'll share in a little bit that made you take make this 180 degree shift in in your comfort I'll say quote air quotes in your comfort of life you spent you said we spend more hours every week working than we do anything else and our mindset around work affects our ability to perform in other areas of our life which we know affects not only your money but your relationships and your health Right? Exactly. And, we'll, and we'll discuss that today. So if we hate what we do, but we spend all of our energy pretending that this is what we're meant to do or have to do uh, through the implants of others, whether that be colleagues, your, your family or whatever that is, then we've got left, less to give to the other important people and areas of our life. That's exactly right. It's all an energy component. So what do you mean by energy component? Oh, my gosh. We all have a certain amount of energy that we get every single day. And at the end of the day, it's a really simple uh, equation. It's you spend that energy either on the things you have to do, whether that's engaging with people or your work or spending time with your family or friends, or you spend it on modifying your behavior to then do those things. Mm -hmm. So the component is really simple. If you're in work that aligns with who you are naturally, then you're just spending less energy there. So you have so much l more energy to give to the rest of the area. So now you're 29, 30? 29. Okay, so we're, we're going to get into this. For the people who are older, established, have families, sole provider of the family, I know for a fact they're going to be thinking, this girl <laughs> has, has nothing to lose at 29 years old. There's, why should I listen to her? And this is a really good show for people to... to, to hear who you are, how you changed, how you help other people change. You have a program to help with that, and we'll talk about that later on. But I don't want to lose anybody in the mix of this because it's not a fluff talk. Hey, you can, you can visualize what you want and get everything you want and you know, leave your career and tell your boss, you know, shove it. it <laughs> no, it doesn't work quite like that. No. So, so I want you to talk about your first job out of college, Wall Street. You know, what is, give, give us that story so people can get this picture of Tracy. Absolutely. Because I, I will say that the humility of it for me is that I had a lot of the things that people will say are the definition of the American success story. And then I lost it all. Mm. And quite honestly, I lost a lot of it on purpose. And that's why I really am passionate about what I do now. But uh, I grew up in Texas. I'm a Flower Mound girl, Flower Mound native. And I actually got recruited to play softball at Yale. So Yale was not something that was ever on our family's trajectory. I was certainly um, very middle class. And in fact, by the time that I graduated, my parents had had to sell their home. They lived in an apartment. And I, as an only child, felt like it was my turn uh, to, to do something about that and to contribute to the family um, more financially than anything else. So Yale has a, is a great institution. I loved going. I'll speak Volumes of it, except that you're wearing your Harvard T-shirt in the in the studio, which is only mildly. You offensive. pulled up with your <laughs> Yaley sticker on the back of your car, so uh, and you're right in front of me sh showing off. So oh, I love it. It's like tech and UT and you know all in one room. But the difference uh, is, you and I are not going to throw <laughs> fists. That's true. Uh, but yeah, so it was a wonderful institution. But very clearly, you can tell that they're in the business of getting you excited about the school your freshman year. And then by your senior year, they want you on what I call career conveyor belts, things that will take you to very lucrative careers, probably so that you can donate back to the school. And that's not a bad thing. It's the just business. that the school is in, in business to keep itself in business. The business. That's fine. It's so a brand. a lot of the things that they had for us as opportunities when we were graduating were very clearly in, in five, what I, like five categories that I, that I noticed. Consulting was one. Uh, finance, a lot of Wall Street jobs. A lot of people go to Capitol Hill. There are a ton of MBA programs that we fed into, and then a lot of really NGOs and nonprofits. So a lot of kids will go to Yale and then spend two years in the Peace Corps. Um, and 
that's what they have for you at career fairs. That's what they have for you at the career service center. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very focused thing. And for me, I was a behavioral psychology major, and it was the first time in my life I got to study anything that I really loved. But if you didn't want to be a counselor, the career service center didn't know what to do with you. Right. So I had a sales background. I had actually sold Cutco knives. Big shout out to all those people out there who've sold Cutco knives in their lives. That's what got me through college. And wow. I worked three jobs while I was on campus wow. for the sports department. Oh, so you're saying are you not a typical millennial? I... Is that what you're saying? <laughs> you're not an entitled millennial? Oh, my. I don't even know what to do with myself. Somebody uh, who's reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> no, I really fe- I- I've always been really thankful for what I have, especially for my parents. And I was like, please don't worry about me for spending money. I'll take care of myself. So. I did that. I had a sales background. So I got into finance truly because they had a job on the trading floor called sales and trading. And I thought, okay, if I can sell knives, I can probably learn to sell just about anything. I'm a pretty good salesperson. They'll mold me and teach me to do whatever they need to teach me. And I went into it with the mindset of this could be really great for me because I was a student athlete. I love high paced intensity. I like a lot of pressure. And if Wall Street is not a pressure cooker, nowhere is. Uh, So I I had high hopes for it, but the minute I got into it, I realized the difference between work that you were made to do Mm. and work that you can do if you work your tail off. But the, the, (laughs) the really funny analogy I always make is there's a difference between a cow in a field and a cow in the ocean. A cow in the ocean can probably learn how to swim, can probably learn how to eat fish, and can probably learn how to speak dolphin, but the dolphin's gonna be swimming circles around it no matter what, no matter how hard the cow works, right? So I was the cow working my tail off, and I was doing fine, but I was getting increasingly more and more miserable uh, to the point where, and you, I, I'm sure people have, have had jobs they hated this much, but I was dreading Mondays. By Friday night, mm. I was dreading Mondays. I got to the point where I mm. didn't want to go to sleep because I didn't want to wake up in the morning, so I was taking NyQuil to go to bed at night. Like It was getting really unhealthy. And at a very young age. Yeah. Imagine the people who are established that do have a family. Now they feel stuck in that position right. or that job. Yeah. And there is a really, and you know, millennials are wildly misunderstood. I don't even use the term. I call my clients quarter life career uh, individuals, mm. but, and, and quarter life is, is very broad. But it, there's a misconception when you're young, too, because if the science behind it is that your prefrontal cortex isn't fully developed, it's not fully developed until you're 27 or 28 years old. Meaning that your view of life is very static. It's why we get so many young people thinking this is all there will ever be. That's why we get a lot of like now depression and and other horrible things that happen to kids in high school. So even in your early 20s, you're still thinking this is my job. So this is my forever. And if you hate it, you feel completely and utterly stuck and without any resources or options. And to add on to that, I actually knew I was miserable. I wanted to make a change. And that was we could do a show on just that two years just of, of figuring out that change was okay, right? which is not what we're going to talk about t- today. But um, I remember calling the Career Service Center, and, and I'll call Yale and say this directly. Uh, I called them and said, I'm two years out of school. I would love some resources. What can you do for me? Anything, a book, a person, a course, whatever. And, and they had nothing mm. for me. To the extent that I asked the woman who was working there, how did you get your job? Just so I could have a story to work from. And she said, oh, I kind of fell into this. And I said, you're a career counselor at one of the best universities in the world, and you fell into your job? Like, what is, does that inspire anybody? Mm-hmm. Is that helping any of the students? Probably not. Mm-hmm. So I, I realized at that point I really needed to make, if I was going to make a change, I had to do it on my own. So for a moment, I'd like to uh, define human capital you're a human capital advisor and we know back in the 60s theodore schultz came up with this term human capital which is where it reflects the the value of uh human capacity within an organization because your organization is only as good as the people within in that organization right (laughs) warren buffett always says hire slow fire fast and you it's the tricky part is not that actually it's actually identifying the right people to have in your organization their yep. mindset, their growth mindset, right? Their attitude, their focus, their aspirations. Yep. What, how do they problem solve and so on? There are actually three components to anybody who's working out in the workforce. And these are what people who hire are looking for. Your head, your heart, and your briefcase. So your head is all the things that are static about you. It's your learning agility. It's your personality. They're your behavioral drives, motivating needs, and then subsequent habits of behavior. So How do you communicate? How do you problem solve? How do you make decisions? And those things can be measured uh, just like your briefcase can be measured via your resume and Mm. what you've done in the past. 
But what's really hard for companies to measure, and it's probably like the golden goose, it's the thing that if the holy grail, if somebody could measure it, they'd be a millionaire or billionaire, is uh, your heart, which is how, your loyalty, how hard you work, what types of choices you make, and where they come from. And that's, that's the thing that companies are really struggling to figure out right now. But in my line of work, I help them prop up all the rest of it and then ask really good questions. So Tracy's website is tracytim.com. It's T-R-A-C-Y-T-I-M-M.com. One of the things, just to backtrack for a moment, you talked about uh, intending something different for yourself. Mm -hmm. Great book by William Bridges called Transitions. And he says, every transition begins with an ending and leads to a new beginning. So let's think about that for a moment. Yep. You're at your job. You hate it. You don't want to be there anymore. You just created an ending to your job. <laughs> you're now in transition, even if you stay there for a year. Yeah. Okay? You're, you're going to be less productive, maybe a little more cranky, not doing well at home. Because yep. of all of that, you're in transition. Now, here's the real tricky part, <laughs> is if you get fired because you sabotage yourself or you quit your job, yep. um, your, your transition is going to lead to a new beginning, and if you don't quote unquote intend the new beginning yep. you may not like it and it's the same thing with relationships you <laughs> beautiful, know beautiful yeah, beautifully said right yeah. you, thank you. you 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 may not like it so same thing with relationships if you if you leave a relationship without the intention of identifying your core values and core value alignment with the next person, you're most likely going to attract the same person in different skin. You're so right. And I wrote a, po- or a blog recently about exactly what you're talking about, and it was why bad careers are like failed relationships and failed diets. Okay. And it's, it's the same ideas that if we don't do, and this is part of the work that I do now, if you don't do the hard internal work on yourself first after a time when you feel like you've failed at something, you are almost doomed to repeat the same mistakes because the only constant in our lives is us. We co-create our reality constantly. So if the only constant is you, then all of the problems in your life go back to you, right? So if you don't work on yourself first and figure out what are my core values, why didn't that career work out? Why wasn't I satisfied or fulfilled in that job? In very clear, uncertain, no uncertain terms, you're you're destined to repeat the same mistakes. So it's interesting that you say this. Number one, 100% truth in what you said. In my experience, my observation, yes. I wrote a new book. It's being edited. We're, we're, in, we're in June now. It's called Potentially You, and I've shared that with yeah. you already. Website's being built, so it's not finished yet. Hopefully sometime in July that'll be ready. And I share that because the first chap- chapter of my book was all about awareness. And then I changed it one day, and I'm not going to go through the whole story because that became the second chapter. The first chapter became care before, before aware. Ah. And if you don't care, it doesn't matter what I say or you say to anybody else. They, if they don't care about why their yeah. relationship or job failed or whatever that is, and they don't, they're not willing to do the work to identify what that is, to discover yep. what their limitations are, impediments are, why they don't you know, move in a certain direction, and they're not fed up like yep. you were at a young age and said, hold on. <laughs> This is not what I was intended to do. Exactly. There's got to be something more. What's my passion and my purpose, yeah. right? If you've not identified that and you don't care enough to do it, then, then you'll continue to get what you're getting, right? Definition of insanity. Exactly, yeah. And so that's the point that I got to. Honestly, I think most people make their transitions in life out of either pain or pleasure. Those are the two things that move human beings, right? And I was in maybe the most severe pain I'd ever been, like super depressed, really just unhappy. I loved my life outside of work, but those 12 hours I spent there every day were pretty painful. Uh, so I knew that I had to make a transition. And for me, that had to be quitting. And so hopefully when we come back, I can kind of go through that story because it's not for everybody. It's, it's kind of like the uh, version of, you know, starting your own company is not for everybody. <laughs> quitting is not for everybody. It's not the answer for everybody. But if you need to make a change to be a better version of yourself, to find your next thing, mm. you have to draw a line in the sand. So I don't recall the, the you might know the, the name of this author, but there's a book called Knowing When to Quit. Ooh. Remember that book? Uh, yes. It's, it's actually winning at quitting win- <laughs> yeah. because you have to know when to do it and be for strategic. For me, knowing when to quit is if you're looking for a sign to quit, it's time to quit. That's the sign. But, That's right. the sign to quit. And make sure you intend <laughs> whatever the new beginning is. Right. Exactly. So we'll talk more about that uh, with Tracy Tim coming up next. Make sure you go to uh, um, iTunes, enter George DiGiani for the podcast of this show and other shows, and rate us. Rate and subscribe because it helps others to learn about this show as well. George DiGiani Train Station Fitness Show. My friend Tracy Tim in the studio. Whoop, whoop.
Woo woo. <laughs> so give me a moment. I'm actually multitasking the thing you're not supposed to do. And I'm putting a little snippet of, t- on t- t- of today's show on Instagram right now of Tracy talking on the radio with her salient commentary about making a profound change, not only in your career, but one that brings you the happiness you desire. I'll tell you what, George, like I didn't realize until I found a job that I actually loved that not only could it could work that you feel fulfilling and feel meaningful about um, not only does that get you to a baseline, it brings you up to a higher level of yourself. Like when you're in a job you hate, you can feel it dragging you down mm. in all the other areas of your life. And all you hope for is baseline. You just want your job to not suck. And if that's your goal, that's fine. But I want people to know that out there, there is something that can make them an even better version of themselves if they want to go find So it. what's interesting about you and what I did at a young age also is I observed other people I wanted to model. Yep. And you shared something with me very, very short about how you identified a, 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 this conversation with a coworker in there and that person's passion, how that kind of lit a fire in you, I guess. Yeah, so it was, it's such a great story. We were, um, so on the trading floor, you barely ever get to leave your desk. It's very, uh, you know, if you're not answering the phone and typing, like you're not doing your job. So before you go further, just to kind of reset that for people who didn't hear the first uh, uh, segment, Tracy used to be on Wall Street. So when you say trading desk. Yes, exactly. Kind of... Thank you for clarifying. You got it. Uh, I try to forget it as much as I can. But this is a great <laughs> story. So uh, we were taking our one five minute break of the day and we had this terrace that you could walk around on the roof of the building because uh, we were out in Connecticut. So um, there was a bridge that went over a creek that ran alongside of the building. And that day that we were walking, they were doing some construction on the bridge. And I just casually noticed it and I mentioned it to an associate of mine and he looked down And I have never, up until that point, I don't think I had ever seen somebody come to life and light up while they were talking about something like he did. And he just started pouring out to me about how he had studied engineering and how passionate he was about construction and how they have to extend bridges in the wintertime or else they'll collapse. And here's exactly how they do it. And he went into this flow state where he was just gone. He was gone. He was a totally different person for that five minutes. And the worst part of the story is that as we rounded the corner back into the office, you could visibly see all that light drain out of him, like as we opened the door to go back inside. And that's when I had my my light bulb moment and decided I was going to quit because I just thought, here's this person who could potentially be God's gift to construction. He could be the next Frank Lloyd Wright for all anybody knows. And yet he's playing someone else's game. He's spending all day every day at a Beautiful. at a place that he hates in a in a doing a job that he tolerates when that's not serving him, it's not serving the company. How old was he? 24. Okay. No, so, he was 23. So no, so no family yet. I was no obligations like that, right? <laughs> yeah, which and was he, even So crazier. he had the ability to make that change if he wanted. But he didn't feel like it. Right. Because of all the expectations that had set up, been set upon him by family, by society, by friends, that you have to have a certain kind of job and a certain level of income in order to be quote unquote successful. So it's interesting you say that. I'll be, I'll be actually teaching a lecture at SMU Cox Business School this fall, and you, you know that. And one of the things I'll be discussing very short uh, uh, part of the discussion is our, our, whether or not we're living with the implants of others, the implants and expectations of others, like I said in the beginning of the show, kind of like uh, a parent expects you to go in this direction or a colleague, you know, because that's what they do and expect you to go in that direction also. And if you're living with the implants of others versus following your own focus and dream and at first identifying what your not only what your passion is, yeah. you can be passionate about something, but if it's not your purpose, mm-hmm. there might be an, some incongruency there. Yeah, there was this woman that I met after I quit my job. And um, I, like I said, I, I had to make a total change in my life. So I quit. I put everything in storage. I actually re-enrolled myself in school and I went on what's called a semester at sea, which some of your listeners might know is an undergraduate study abroad program. But I went on as a 25-year-old uh, to get just to get away. And there was this woman that I met who was doing the same type of uh, total getaway, but she was 45 and she had been a social worker her entire life. And she knew she, her heart wasn't in it anymore. And she had no idea what to do. And she was like, listen, the number one thing I'm doing right now is I'm not shooting myself to death anymore. I should do this. I should mm. do that. I should be here by now. I should make X by now. I'm done with it because all the shoulds that you place on yourself are completely fake. Where do they come from? They come from other people who are living other lives, who live by other standards. Like It comes from, I, I think, maybe a self-worth, a place where we don't feel good enough. And, and if you listen to your conversation, if, if somebody ever becomes aware of their conversation, I have to, I need to, I should, 
right? Yeah. That is real hard. And, and, I, and I remember last, years ago when I was your age at 29, I went to therapy once a week for three years, and it was very valuable to me because yeah. I learned how to communicate, mm -hmm. and I learned a lot. I became very aware. And then the one thing this person had asked me, this psychologist asked me, profound question to me at the time, when do you ever give yourself a break? <laughs> and that's all she needed to say. Yep. And that's real interesting how that made some shifts in my life, my decisions and my thinking. Yeah, absolutely. I think therapy is wonderful <laughs> and getting to talk it out is amazing. And and what it helped me discover is that comparison is the killer of joy. One hundred percent. And I didn't I didn't make that up. It's definitely a quote. You can go Google it. I don't remember who said it, but it, it's truly when we get outside of ourselves and our own set of circumstances and we compare ourselves to someone else who, by the way, has completely different life circumstances. You don't know anything about their story. You don't know if they go home at the end of the day and cry themselves to sleep because they're being fake all day I long. I love that. Right. Good you job. don't have any you don't know anything about them when it comes to when it comes down to it. So by comparing ourselves to other people, we're just setting ourselves up for personal failure. So let's get into the health side of this for a yes. moment. Studies show 70% of American workforce either unengaged or actively disengaged in their work. How does that affect somebody's health, Tracy? Goodness. So disengagement is pretty incredible. And it goes back to this energy thing that we talked about at the very beginning. So in my line of work, I use a particular behavioral assessment that I love that can actually measure how engaged somebody is in their role from a stimulus response perspective. So in behavioral psychology, the way that they can measure uh, what really resonates with a person is through this stimulus response type of activity. So you can either put somebody in a physical environment and give them some type of event or stimulation and see how they react. Or you can give them now, which is much more uh, modern and common, a survey that replicates the same thing. So that's what I do for, for my organizational clients is help them figure out how each of their people are stimulated and motivated. And subsequently, you can figure out who is incredibly disengaged. And it creates all the things that we hate. It creates burnout. It creates a lack of energy, just not only in your work, but then outside of your work, you have so much less of yourself to give. And it tugs on all these other major indicators of our um, of our health, like so you and I let's, were talking. Let's about. talk about this for a moment. Are you talking about the strengths test that you gave me? Uh, yes, yeah, so the predictive index. Is the so, one so right. About. So, I think it, just give us a snippet of that because you say you, you you started talking about how you take somebody through this, and then you you yes. talk about the benefits <laughs> of it. But I think let's add some credibility and some foundation here about what this is. What's the science behind it? it as much as you know, in a very concise. Oh yeah. Uh, 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 Absolutely. So there, oh my gosh, you could talk again for days. Behavioral psychology is a very deep, very highly contested field. Um, but if you get into the assessment world, forget it, right? Like there, you, you and I could have the George and Tracy assessment out tomorrow <laughs> and new things are coming up all the time. So what you want to look for is something that's been around for quite a while and that is psychometrically driven. Mm -hmm. So I don't just want, who am I today? Uh, from a personality or behavioral perspective, I want to know what are my most likely behaviors mm. under pressure and mm. under stress so that I can align myself with an organization and with an environment that takes advantage of those behaviors. Because you and I both know if you're in the wrong role, you can have all the strengths in the world, but your strengths can immediately become liabilities Absolutely. if you're in the wrong role. Like work, me, we, we can completely work against you. Here's, here's the big part. Regardless of your intention. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is sad because then people think that you have negative intentions when in reality you just probably shouldn't be in that job. Absolutely. Right? And it's part of the, 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 the manager or the, the owner of the business to identify where to put that person in which role because sometimes they're meant to be in your company, just not in the role you gave them. You're exactly right. And that's what I help companies identify is you've got all these rock stars who have incredible potential but wherever you're putting them either allows them to realize that potential or keeps them from realizing that potential. And that's just the truth. That's the reality. And every, everybody out there who's listening, you know you've had a time where it happened to you or it happened to someone you work with. You had an amazing contributor, frontline person who just was an awesome worker bee who got you know, moved up to management. Were they ever meant to manage people? No. Do they like managing people? No. But does that look like a very clear succession plan like you should be moving up in your career yes so they think they want it they get it and immediately realize i don't even like people i like doing my job and then you've lost two people right you've lost the manager and you've lost the great contributor and so we I actually had a case study on that on somebody on wall street who who was doing who, me <laughs> yeah this person was doing extraordinarily well and was promoted but should not have been promoted and wound up 
messing up that part of the organization. And that's and, the worst part is know. that it's like a bad apple. Yeah. It just poisons the rest of the group and it poisons that person. And, and like I said, it all goes back to your potential and allowing someone to realize that. So from a behavioral psychology perspective on this assessment, for instance, uh, this one particularly is stimulus response based. So it mm-hmm. allows us to figure out how does this person react to stimuli in their environment and what's their baseline level of reaction, meaning What's their habit of behavior? What's their habit of communicating? What's their habit of uh, problem solving or making decisions? Because when's the last time you readdressed how you brush your teeth or how you like to sit in a chair? Like our, our core behaviors are just like that. And if we're not motivated to change them, we don't. So it's so much more efficient and effective to just align somebody with work that, that they're made for than to force them into, you know, square peg into a round hole. So coming up next, I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to leave you with this instead of just putting you on the spot. We're going to create a scenario here, or I am. Male making $250,000 a year, married, children. None of this is true. Married, children, right? Yep. Hate my career, not following my passion, but one day I wake up and I found out what that is. Or I, I recalled from when I was younger, I found out what that is. Yep. Making a good living for myself and my family. Yep. Nice house, big mortgage, can afford it, a couple of toys, living that life, going on vacation. And I say to my significant other, other honey, <laughs> I've found my purpose and passion in life. I know exactly what I want to do, and I, and I want you to support me. And he or she says, that's great. I want to support you. And you say, okay, this is great. Let me tell you what it is. I want to be a teacher, and it only makes $40,000 a year. <laughs> <laughs> how do you help someone like that to make a transition? And that is a very big question that I, do, I know does not have one answer. It's multifaceted. Yes. So we'll talk more with Tracy Tim coming up next. Go to tracytim.com. Great website. And she also has a program she wants to promote coming up next called The Nth Degree. George DiGiani, train station fitness show. My guest and friend in the studio, Tracy Tim. Go to her website, amazing website, tracytim.com, T-I-M-M. I left her with a question because, well, let me back up first. Tracy's talking about how helping you not only to identify your passion and your purpose in life, but to actually move in that direction and to do so to do so e- with, with ease and grace to the best you possibly can. Because when you move in the direction you want to move in life, life is much more exciting. And I also want to add to what you said that it's your passion and your purpose right now, sure, which will change over time. Which we Our just purpose discussed. In life changes all the time. Yeah, and 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 it's it's letting it's understanding that and letting yourself go of it has to be the one mm. thing that I'm passionate about or the one purpose that I have because that's what trips people up mm-hmm. and that keeps you from moving forward because you think it has to be right mm-hmm. and that there is only one. When mm-hmm. in reality, like right now, I have a totally different purpose than when I'm uh, when I'm going to be a wife or when I'm going to be a mother or. When I'm finally Tony Robbins, you know, like my, my purpose is going to change over time. And, and that's something for people to really understand and to, to take all the weight off their shoulders of like, I only have one passion, one purpose, and I don't know what that is. So you talk about taking the weight off your shoulders, and I left you with this scenario. You have someone, a sole provider in, the, in, in, in a, uh, um, a family who has a family, has children, has some yeah. toys, has a mortgage, right? Making $250,000 a year and decide they want to make a career move and follow their passion and purpose, which is being a teacher. And they're only going to make forty or $50,000 a year, whatever teachers make. I don't know. Maybe some make twenty. I don't know. Maybe, maybe some make a hundred. I have no clue. And it's going to significantly affect the, the entire family from that uh, perspective. How does someone shift yeah. into that direction? Because there are other things that are going to be much more challenging. There are. And this is the process that I teach. Um, I'm putting it into an online course in the fall called the Nth Degree Academy. Uh, But right now in one-on-one coaching, I teach the Nth Degree methodology to people. And it's such a good question. I would say even to back up to a pre-thought before it gets to the I know what I want to do is that everybody comes to me and says, I have no idea what I want to do. I never get the person who says, I know I want to be a teacher, but how do I make that transition? Uh I always get the person who says, I hate my job. I make a great living. I feel like I have golden handcuffs on, and I don't know what else to do. Do you feel, or or in your experience, do you believe that maybe when someone says they don't know what they want to do, it's because it's it's maybe not so much because they haven't sat down to think about what that is as much as it is they, that they don't they won't allow themselves to? Oh, 100%. 100%. So that's why the first step in the nth degree process is now. Yeah. Every step starts with N. It's plan words, but it's also your limitless potential. Um, and the, the 
sub line of the course is take your career from stuck to unstoppable because everybody comes to me with that stuck feeling of I might know what I want to do. Even if I don't, I don't know how to get there, right? Even if I do, I don't know how to get there. So the first step is now. And the first part of the now phase is a very, what I call a very simple life audit. So what trips most people up is that they have not stopped to take stock of what they actually have going for them. And they feel that their job is the number one indicator of success in their life. Mm. Okay. So let me use myself for an example. When I was going to try to quit my job, I was beyond terrified of leaving a job without another job. And my number one thought in mind was like, but I need health insurance. I need benefits. I need to take care of You're myself. Being right? reasonable, logical. Totally. And that's a, that's a great first thing to think of. But I want to back people up and say, look at all the major areas of your life, physical, mental, emotional, social, spiritual, financial. There are two more that I can't name off the top of my head. But uh, professional, right? Look at all the components of your life, not just your job, mm-hmm. and realize you have a much greater foundation and launch pad than you think you actually have. So for me, for instance, when I looked at all of those components, I realized I'd actually saved a pretty good chunk of money when I was being really honest with myself. In two years at the bank, I saved like $30,000 in liquid savings, so not my 401k. So I had a great backstop there, right? I had um, a great degree from a great school. I had incredibly supportive friends and family. I had, And then when I quit, I actually had the physical freedom to explore whatever it was that I really wanted to do. So in your scenario of I make twenty five two hundred fifty thousand dollars, I have a wife, I have three kids, like that's your now. That's your reality, your environment, where you are right now. So take stock of all that and realize how much you have going for you, whether it's the financial part, whether it's the support part, whether it's the I can take part time work, I can do this, I can do that, and bring it all together so that you're not starting from a point of I don't have enough to move forward. It's what can I bring together in my life right now to know that I have a launch pad to move forward. Mm -hmm. So the now phase is really important. Doing that life audit goes directly into creating a set of core values, which we just talked about. The core values precipitate creating core commitments. Core commitments are, and and this is the, I love this analogy. I use this all the time. Um, Not having commitments and looking for a job is exactly like going into the grocery store, agonizing over a jar of peanut butter, only to find out you're allergic to peanuts. There's no point. There's absolutely no point, and people are wasting time doing it. You're wasting time on job boards. You're wasting time on LinkedIn. You're wasting time looking for jobs when you have not done the work to figure out what your core commitments are. And so for me, what that ended up doing was, and this is skipping way forward in my story, but after I quit, after I went around the world, after I came back, started working for a consulting, uh, a woman who owned her own consulting firm, I went back to working for somebody else in mm. another corporate job. In reality, if I had done the hard work of figuring out my commitments first, I would have realized freedom is probably my number one core not only Not only your commitments and core values, but also identifying who you are and how you are. Correct. So that's step two and three in the Instagram process is nature and nurture. Right. Who you are and what you've learned how to do over time. Right. Um, So where your now nature and nurture come together, if you imagine that as like a triple Venn diagram, the middle part is your niche. Mm. It's you. And it's you right now. And because your now will change over over your lifespan. Right now I don't have, you know, a deep family. I've got my mom that I want to take care of. But um, that's – and so that's top of mind, right? But – I don't even have a pet, <laughs> you know, like I could, I'm location independent. If I really wanted to get up and go for whatever reason, I could do that. Not everybody has that set of circumstances, which is why the now part is so important. Mm. So you put your now together with your nature. Again, your nature is what you can get from an assessment like the predictive index or strengths finder, something that really uh, gets to the heart of who you are. And also you have to ask people because, mm. uh, you know, p- there's a great woman, Sherry uh, Scott, Car- Sherry Carter Scott, who wrote the uh, "If Life Is a Game, These Are the Rules" book, which is quite honestly my favorite book of all time. It's like only a coffee Say table the book, title but it's again. amazing. It's called "If Life Is a Game, These Are the Rules." Okay, uh, and she has these ten rules for living that allegedly you forget upon birth and you must learn <laughs> before you're done. Uh, and one of them is that others are only mirrors of ourselves. Mm. So all the things that you hate in other people, likely the things you hate about yourself, and the things that you admire, things you wish you had. Right. So in in that regard, it's. Um, getting the feedback of other people to figure out what they see in you that you might not see in yourself, especially when you're in a dark place of hating your work. And, and as you know, that affects your mindset, affects your health. So it, it just narrows your, your scope of vision down. Right. right? 
So the now phase is meant to open your scope of vision back up. And then throughout the rest of the nth degree process, we narrow it down intelligently. Mm. So instead of narrowing it back down on peanut butter because you're allergic, you narrow it down to almond butter. And like all the jobs that you want are in that sort of bucket, right? right? So now meets nature, meets nurture, which is what you've learned how to do over time, which is both... I call your career masterpiece both a painting and a sculpture. So painting is taking what you love and putting it on the canvas, right? You got a blank canvas, take what you love and put it on there. A sculpture is chipping away at the things that are not your, yours, not things that you don't love. Um, and you can create your career masterpiece both ways. So it's really important because my biggest fear was that I had wasted two and a half years of my life learning something I would never use again. When in reality, if you're living life the right way, Nothing is wasted. So I want to interject for a moment. That was your fear. And for the people who are older in their latter 30s, 40s, and, and later, <clears throat> um, in my experience, because I've been doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one consulting and mm -hmm. coaching uh, as well, my, my, my program is different. And I help people to release or neutralize the impediments that, that prevent them from moving forward. And I say that, number one, for this information, most people are not aware of, uh, and it's all based upon my, my book. But number two, do you find that the biggest obstacle with people in changing, whatever change looks like to them, is due to being stuck in their story and that's their identity? So this is a health and fitness show. If you have somebody who's 100 pounds overweight and they've been 100 pounds overweight for 40, 50 years, then you say, you know what? I have all the tools to help you lose all the weight. Here you go, they're for free. All right, then there's that perceived value. So let's say they paid for them, now they see the value, and they're, they're a little uncomfortable, right? Yeah. And so they do that. They will either not do it because of fear of being perfect, or, they will, or, or they'll sabotage their success because they're stuck in their story. Who would I be if I lost 100 pounds? What would my story be? And that's that fear of the unknown of who they will be. So you need to move in a particular direction with intention. Yeah. It's, it's you find that that's the biggest preventer of change not your age but older elizabeth gilbert says the only it is always and only fear hmm. if you break it down it is always and only fear that is in the way of anything we want anything we think we want making any sort of change in our lives and and the identity thing is huge like and i've quit several things in my life and i, I wrote a blog post um called the art of quitting <laughs> or no it's called on quitting and i and i love it um because when you quit something like, like for me, I, I was a varsity athlete and I quit uh, my sport halfway through college. And so all of a sudden I wasn't Tracy, the softball player anymore. I was just Tracy, the Yale student. And that was boring, right? Like to me, I, I completely lost my identity. So then when I left Wall Street, I was no longer, you know, my, my dad was so proud to tell people what I did for a living. Of course. My daughter does this and makes so much money, and, which he should never have told people. But, well, that was, but you know, yeah. proud parents, right? right. So <clears throat> I felt like I was letting a lot of people down, and I was giving up. The worst part of it is that you feel like you're giving up something that other people would be more than grateful to have. We have three and a half minutes, and I want you to get the most important points out that people need to have to understand to begin moving in the direction that, that they desire and deserve in life what what are those number one we had talked about identity identifying your talents your nature your nurture um, yeah. right what you've learned um uh, uh, going through your nth degree process is yeah. quite important because you want to get laser focused most people are not focused yeah. they're kind of all over the place and they think they know everything in their head no you got to write it down and the hardest part for them is articulating it to other people i went through this with a friend of mine just last night and she was saying even if i knew what i wanted how do i tell it to other people so going through the now nature and nurture mm. components by the end of that we actually have a pitch like i call it a pitch it's good and you and you write it down and you sort of almost memorize it and then step four is taking it to your network. So I would say the next most important thing for people to know is you do not want to go it alone. You do not want to go it alone. Probably when you are disidentifying with your career and you don't feel like a successful person, it's when you want to go internal the most. It's embarrassing. It doesn't feel good to tell people you don't know what you want to do. For me, it didn't feel good to tell people that I had a Yale degree, but I was working at Nick and Sam's Grill, Lululemon, writing online textbook content and freelancing. And barely getting by. But that's what I had to do to start my business, right? So in my mind, I could justify it. But at the same time, it was hard. It was really hard. So, But the only time when you can make real meaningful change in your life is when you share it with other people. Because your network can put puzzle pieces together that you can't. 
it's just like every you know everybody's always good at giving you external relationship mm. advice or external sure. career advice because they're not emotionally attached to exactly. it. it's not their issues so it ha- you have to get it out of yourself right. and onto other people and people want to help you your friends and family want to help you your network wants mm. to help you and the human brain wants to close loops intuitively so if you mm. bring a problem to somebody like i don't know what this job is called but i know what my now nature and nurture i know what my niche is what do you think it's called do you know somebody who does that kind of work they start putting the puzzle pieces together. And then all you have left to do, step five, is navigate and figure out which of those paths is right for you. And largely, it's the one that stands the test of time. I want to compliment this for a moment. When I was in business school, my, my leadership professor, first day, first thing he taught, by the way, it was, it was Robert Kaplan, who's now our Dallas Fed chair. Yes. Okay. Love uh, Bob Kaplan. Anyway, he taught us <clears throat> about leaders, what makes leaders fail. And he said, there's two things that makes a leader fail. Isolation. So there's your whole yep. network story, right? Isolation. Isolation is also a way to make yourself miserable. There's a great book on that. Okay. And then also <laughs> number two is inability to learn. And then as and then when I left business school, I thought, well, I want to add a third one to that because I found some very intelligent people who have, uh, well, regardless, who, who are very intelligent people, they're not isolated. They certainly have the ability to learn, but they can't execute. Ah, and yeah. so a leader will fail I, if they're isolated Inability to learn and inability to execute. That's where the navigation phase comes in. Absolutely. It's total execution. It's making your plan a reality, which I'll say is probably my, the hardest thing for me because I'm an activator. Right. But if you figure yourself out, number one, do the now nature nurture part. You don't go it alone. So network. And then you implement and navigate. You cannot go wrong. I've never seen it fail. Tracy, love having you here. We'll have you on the show again. Thank you. Hopefully this helped a whole bunch of people, which I know if you're ready to an old Buddhist saying that, uh, that is, is very profound. If the, if the student is ready, the teacher will come. And hopefully we've helped you today.